I had empathy because I was the other. You know, I wasn't your normal English boy. You know, I was from another country. I wasn't, I was an immigrant. So having that outsider's perspective more than anything really is what my work is about or makes it what it is. We need to sort of call out all the different companies. It's not just enough having black models on your Instagram feeds or, you know, in magazines, because that's the norm now. But we need education. We need people behind the scenes who can get a seat at the table. We need, you know, bursaries you know, bursary for people. We need to find different ways of recruitment. For me, for this to last, people need to be behind the scenes. It's imperative. Hello, and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm Robin Gavon, Senior Critic at Large for The Washington Post. And joining me today is Edward Enenfall. He is the first male editor-in-chief of British Vogue, and he is also the first black editor of Vogue in either Britain or in the US. He's also the author of a new memoir, A Visible Man. Edward, welcome. And uh, I just want to let everyone know that you can join the conversation by tweeting your thoughts or questions uh, to at post live and um, hopefully we'll be able to get to a couple of those questions. So Edward, I would love to just kind of start with your origin story, as they say. Um, you um, grew up uh, the early part of your life um, in Ghana. And you, you talk a bit in your memoir about the impact that your, your mom had on your fascination for clothes and style. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that? So my mother was a seamstress. Um, she had an atelier in a town called Accra in Ghana. And my earliest memories were really my mom fitting women women of all shapes, women of all sizes. You know, I had sort of aunts and nieces and cousins who were really curvy women. So for me, that's how I grew up, watching my mom sort of make incredible fashion, you know, African fashion, huge turbans, sort of you know, whittled waist, peplums. So I grew up in a world of just amazing color and design and style. And I would always help her, you know, sort of zip women into their clothes. I was, you know, play with the eyelets and design with her. So for a child, you know, who was sort of a creative, that was the happiest. That was my happiest place to be. Well, I'm, I'm going to give your mom her due and I'm going to call her a designer because it sounds like she was doing everything that designers do. Yes. I mean, she, you know, she did everything from from sketching to cutting the patterns herself to fitting. And she always referred to herself as a seamstress. And for me, the beauty of those days is just learning how a woman feels when she looks great in what she's wearing, you know? So that really I got from, from my mother and the idea that beauty comes in all forms, you know? Beauty comes in all shapes and sizes. And she really instilled that in me. And I know that there was upheaval then in the with the family when you were about thirteen. Uh, there was some unrest in in Ghana, and you, and the family was sort of split up. But you all ended up in London. Um, how jarring was that to you as a young man of a young boy of thirteen? Because I mean, Robin, you have to understand. I grew up in Ghana. It's a black country. Everybody was black. You know, 
My, my relatives were black, my friends were black. And then we had to leave because, you know, there's a military coup and my dad's in danger. And we end up in England and I realized, oh my God, that we're the minority in England. You know, from having gone from being sort of the majority culture and having to learn how to relate to a different country, essentially. I, I, I always said, you know, at home, you know, I was Ghanaian because my parents spoke the language, the food was Ghanaian, you know, and then I'd leave and go to school and it was fish and chips and, you know, <laughs> English lessons. And I was in England and I never really felt like I belonged, you know, but I feel like this duality, I always talk about this duality, really, is what sort of enabled me to do what I do today. Really, you know, I'm an insider and an outsider. I've always been. So yes, it was quite tough. It was quite tough, and ended up in Margaret Thatcher's Britain of the time, which really wasn't the friendliest place for people of colour. And having to learn English, you know, so fast and perfect it. It was tough, but you know, it was a good lesson. It was a good lesson for me. I'm curious though, having come from, as you said, a, a, a country where you know everyone was black and where you looked around and the, the highest ranking people in authority were black did that also it just mean that you came despite the jarring nature of of england but that you also came with a sense of confidence in your abilities yeah let's sort of talk about the duality there was a, there was one side was not feeling good enough because you're in a different country the other side was i come from a country where it's possible to be black and be anything you want. And, you know, you can be, you could be, you could be a writer, you know, you can be a, a politician. That was what I knew. So in a way, sort of navigating my way through the fashion industry, that's always sort of stayed with me that black people can be whoever they want to be and achieve whatever they need to achieve. And I think that definitely came from having grown up in a place like Ghana. I mean, your entry into the fashion industry, I mean, it, it almost seems sort of preordained, and yet it was relatively serendipitous. Um, you were sort of plucked in that sort of magical way from the street and asked uh, to be a model. Um, how did your parents respond to that? I mean, Robin, I mean, my parents come from a culture where you're supposed to be a lawyer or a doctor or, you know, have an academic profession. Being in the media wasn't part of that. And being a model was certainly at, a, at the bottom of it. So I remember being stopped on the train by a, a great stylist called Simon Foxton, uh, who gave me his card. And I remember mum just saying, no, not that industry. I didn't know what she meant at the time, but, you know, I was 16. I wore her down and... I said to some of the, my first day on a photo shoot, I realized this is where I want it to be. And it felt like, you know, Willy Wonka or something, like the, the world had opened, but my parents, you know, my mother was into it, but my father wasn't happy. He wasn't happy at all. And eventually he ended up sort of kicking me out of home. But now I realized that it wasn't really his fault all these years later. He didn't know what the media was. He didn't know about journalism. He didn't know about styling. So at the time, it was tough. Very tough. I mean, in many ways, people will talk about, um, you know, sort of finding their tribe when they step into the fashion world. And it seemed like from your memoir that that was very much true for you, particularly as a young black gay man, that you sort of found uh, at least a sense of your tribe. Um, but it was also challenging because as you as you write in the memoir, race was this complicating factor. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, your your home, and you leave home, so that's the first home, and then you find a second home, which is like your gay family, and you realize that that setting also has its rules. You know, that anybody who liked sort of black men was a dinch queen. Anybody who liked East Asian man was a was a, you know a rice queen and so so on and so forth. So it was the first time I really experienced sort of being someone's fantasy, and it didn't sit right with me. And the racism that was sort of 
around the scene at that time made it difficult. But of course, I had my cousins and I had, you know, sort of close friends who were gay. So we kind of navigated our way through the system, you know, the gay, the gay world. And then through fashion, I sort of meeting people like myself, you know, being, being black, I was literally the, probably the only editor in England. Um, I was 18 years old when I started at ID. And it was very important to me that I also had my tribe. So I met a makeup artist, you know, a young makeup artist called Pat McGrath. And, you know, I'd work uh, with her. A name I think a lot of people now know. <laughs> well, yes, Pat was like, um, just makeup artist who did music work. And when I started at ID Magazine, I wanted to sort of have, like you said, my tribe. So I, I, I got Pat and sort of brought her into the fashion industry. And, and I heard there was another model, you know, a young model was really coming up and her name was Naomi Campbell and we met and it was love I think of first heard of her. <laughs> the tribe. And you know, for me it wasn't enough being the only one. I just felt that if I had been blessed with this role, then I had to bring other people up with me. I had it, it I didn't just want to be the token. I wanted to have a tribe around me. Ben Skirvin, the hairdresser was another one. And you know, we had each other. You know, it's really important to have your tribe because that's the only way you can bounce ideas of each other. The only way you can, you know, seek shelter. So I was very lucky to have these great people in my life from a very, very young age. You wrote, you started in the, the indie magazine world. I mean, you mentioned ID. It was very focused on youth culture. What did you learn from that experience at a magazine like that um, that you have been able to, that has informed really uh, the work that you now do at a magazine like British Vogue? Robin, I always say everything I learned then is what I use now. Because when I started at ID, I was 18 years old. I was the youngest fashion director and I didn't have an assistant and it was a monthly magazine. And I remember I would shoot the covers. I would write the cover lines. I would run to stores to do the shopping pages. I would write the features. And then I'll go to the advertising department to learn about you know, how to sell ads. You know, we had these ID nights where we'd go around the country selling the magazine. So I did, I did, I did that too. Basically, I was so hungry for information and I was so hungry to learn. I'll be in the art department. So the, my work now really is an extension of that because there's no department that I haven't worked in and there's nothing that I haven't done in a fashion magazine. And so those are early days of ID where, you know, I was, I was broke, I was penniless, but I had a dream. And I was obsessed with my work. And everything I learned there still serves me today. You know? So you must always cover the basics. Yeah, and when you got to British Vogue, I mean, can you just describe what, um, what British Vogue was like um, five years ago, what its um, sort of sensibility was? and its place in sort of the fashion ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, when I started the British Folk in 2017, there, there, there was not really conversations. There were no conversations about diversity or inclusivity. Um, I mean, I saw a magazine that I guess reflected at its time. It was sort of very Eurocentric. And I looked around and saw all my friends and women I admired, and they were all very diverse, you know? So I thought with this magazine, it was the perfect time to speak to women of all ages, of all races, religions, sizes, social economic background. For me, it felt like the time was right. And you know, my whole career, I've always been sort of championing that anyway, but especially at British Vogue, I thought it would be a great time for the world, you know, to be reflected on the pages of the magazine, like it was in the seventies. So I didn't really, you know, rewrite the rules, but I really felt an urgent need to show diversity in all its forms and let the world know that, you know, there was beauty in inclusivity. I mean, you, the magazine has really been in the forefront of focusing on diversity and inclusivity. And I've always been struck that it, um, you know, has, it has a smaller uh, economic footprint than uh, American Vogue, for instance, where you also uh, worked. I mean, how much does it matter that 
uh, the mag that British Vogue is a somewhat smaller publication that um, it's able to push boundaries, uh, maybe move faster than some of its siblings. I mean, you know, I mean, you have to put, I guess, British Vogue in the context of Great Britain. You know, in England, it's always been about out trying, outdoing each other in style. It's always been about sort of, when you really look at our designers, it's always been about pushing the envelope. You know, there was never much money in Great Britain when it came to fashion. So you always had to use your imagination. So for me to be able to get a magazine that was so, so part of the establishment, but be able to sort of play with culture, you know, it, it's, for me, it's a cultural magazine. It's not a fashion magazine, you know music, film, politics, all comes under the umbrella of culture. So it was a really exciting moment to sort of take this historical magazine, 106 years old, and sort of drag it into, into today. Because the circulation wasn't, you know, the biggest, I was really sort of left alone. But a few months later, you know, advertising doubled, you know, circulation doubled and we're able to move, play with culture, talk about the zeitgeist, you know, with my small team and what about the, the lion, that was, the mouse that roared, you know, and we're able to sort of, <laughs> mouse that roared, we were able to sort of really do what we believe and the brilliant thing is the world seems to sort of have embraced it and we're very, very grateful for that. I'm very grateful for that too. Yeah, I mean, the cover stars that you've had ranging from, you know, Oprah to Rihanna to Beyonce um, would make any editor uh, jealous, I think. I mean, what do you think really perhaps um, lures women like that into British Vogue? I mean, do you, do you feel that they believe that they will be represented in a different way or in um, just in a very particular way? I mean, you know, I feel like even throughout my career, whether it was Italian Vogue or even American Vogue or Dove I always believed in sort of transformations, you know, sort of. And can I just interrupt for one second to let our audience know that you were really instrumental in the uh, Italian Vogue's quite um, historical uh, issue that focused on black models. I mean, it was entirely black models in the editorial shoots. So that's just yeah. a little aside about your impact. Please go on. <laughs> um, basically, I've always been sort of interested in sort of transformations. And, you know, I'm obsessed with women. As I always say, I love women in all their shapes, their sizes, all their forms. And so, oh, I think I've lost Robin. Robin yep, I'm here. I think I lost you for a second. So for me, it was always about how can I create a version of Oprah you haven't seen before? How do I create something with Beyonce who's done everything or Rihanna who's done everything? How do we present a, a new way for the world to see them? So then you have, you know, whether it's Rihanna with a 30s, 1930s brow or Beyonce on a horse with that huge hat, it, it's always, I always want to show the world a version of a person they haven't seen before, not just photographically, but also sort of, you know, get them to say something different. And for me, that I've always been excited by that. I mean, do you feel at this stage in, in your career that you have been able to, um, you know, as, as people like to say, transcend race, you know, can, can you get a cab in New York? Do you still have those moments when, um, and, and you've discussed them certainly in the past, where you know you you walked into the offices, uh, you know, at Vogue House, and uh, someone at the front desk tried to send you to the loading dock. Um, I mean, do you feel that you have gotten to a place where that is something that is now behind you? Oh my God, no. <laughs> I mean, you can never transcend race. When I leave the house, I'm a black man. I'm a very dark skinned black man. Um, I will always be that. And incidents like what happened when I was sent to the loading bay kind of keep me grounded and makes me realize that there's still work to be done. 
And I'm glad for those moments or when, you know, a taxi doesn't stop for me on the street and my partner has to hail it. Those moments make me realize there's work to be done. So no, race is not behind me because there's always work that we need to do. And what specifically do you think the fashion industry needs to be doing in order to progress, to continue the progress that, um, that you have helped to set in motion? I mean, you know, I spoke sort of, as you said in your intro, the idea of needing more people of color behind the scenes and not just on the runways, not just, you know, where people can see, not the performative part. I just believe that there needs to be more pledges made and kept, you know. I always go back to sort of having people come in on the mid to upper level and not always necessarily interns because the culture of a place sometimes doesn't allow that. And also, you know, yes, we talk about, you know, different ways of recruiting. We're finding that, you know, the wider we reach out, the more sort of diverse people we can em em sort of embrace. And a lot of companies you might find, a lot of young kids feel they don't belong in certain companies. So they need to see people like you, Robin, they need to see people like me to be able to even digest, oh, I can work at the Washington Post or I can work at Fell. So there's a lot of work to be done in any, in any company. You know, what are the challenges of uh, being in your position, being that sort of um, the, the rare bird at, at that level? I mean, I, I think about what just recently happened during Paris Fashion Week when a Vogue editor criticized uh, aspects of a show by the artist formerly known as Kanye West. You know, and, and Vogue stepped up and issued a statement in support of her. but. I mean, what are the challenges of being at that level, being a representative, being an, uh, an I, a symbol, but also being able to step up and criticize honestly? I mean, I feel it's part of our jobs, you know. I mean, I always talk about empathy. I, you know, I empathize a lot when you look at my work. It's all about that. And I also know people, people talk about work. I mean, that's a new conversation now. I don't call it work. I call it what is right. I believe in what's right, you know, in any situation. In any situation, I will try to do what I think is right. So that's really, really something that I carry with me despite the position I have or I have had. It's about trying to do the right thing. And sometimes, you know, hey, sometimes I make mistakes. But hopefully I can follow my instincts and keep following my instincts to try to do what's right in any situation. What What is the pressure like to be in your position when so many people, as you said, look to you as uh, a symbol of progress, uh, look to you um, to open doors? I mean, you're one person. You obviously can't open every door for every person. Um, how do you how do you balance that pressure? I mean, you know, I, 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 I take that very seriously. I don't take that lightly, you know, but also, I also know that I, I also came into the industry as a creative. So I try to balance both the responsibility as well as the fun parts of the job. And it's, it's just an ongoing process. You know, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But I always try to take the responsibility I have. I take it very seriously. But I also always try to have fun with that, you know. So you see all the fun covers, you see, you know, the fun parties we have. And I try to navigate both with a smile, essentially. <laughs> you know. I mean, in the memoir, you talk very um, uh, at, at length about um, struggles with sobriety and a feeling that you were, you know, drinking too much. You know, is some of that, do you think, just part of the pressures that people put on themselves in an industry like fashion that um, is sort of relentless? It yeah. is very much uh, focused on the surface while you're also trying to navigate your own interior life. Um, I mean, how, how have you been able um, to sort of maintain your sobriety? 
I mean, you know, it took me a long time. You know, I was an editor when I was 18 years old. So my whole work, my whole work um, was sort of really intertwined with my life. And, you know, at that age, you can go out, come home, go to work, you know, have that energy. But the older I got, I realized that, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't. And in my, you know, in my early 30s, I decided I didn't want to drink and I wanted to really focus. It's very hard for young people today. You know, they have to deal with imposter syndrome. They have to deal with, like you said, you know, feeling the need to work, to be, to gratify who they are, to show who they are to the world. It's not an easy way to navigate. So with me, I was glad that I was able to find a program that thought me about sort of taking care of not just myself, but others as well. Sort of being, having sort of a, uh, a spiritual side, which really I never really had before. And just really seeing everybody as equal. You know, I might be Edward, the editor, you might be whoever you are, but we're all equal and we all contribute something to the world. So that's what it really, it really, you know, taught me. And that's why I wrote this book as well, to help all those people who are suffering, you know, whether it's with addiction, whether it's with imposter syndrome, whether it's with health issues. I wanted the young generation to know that I have been through it all. You know, a lot of people think we just end up where we are that we ended up at the top, but there's always a journey. And, you know, the successes got me here, but really what got me here was the failures, the things I failed at and learned from. Well, I mean, I have to ask you uh, the million dollar question, so I will ask it this way. Um, where would you like to see yourself in five years from now? Oh, the five year question. I mean, <laughs> Very, I'm a, I'm a very creative person at the moment. Like I always said, you know, I like doing what I'm doing here at British World, um, as well as sort of dealing with, now I have to look after the European Vogue's, England, you know, England, Spain, Germany, Italy, and France, and working with these young editors kind of gets me really, really excited. And, you know, I'm a creative person, you know. I'm, you know, I want to look into other things like, you know, directing or, producing and yeah really let my creativity sort of flow as they say would you like to um have a chance at shaping the american market i mean i think you know anna does a very great job doing what she does and as i said to her the other day i said you know i am not after your job but we work very well together and i'm really happy where i am right now well, I will uh, end this with the uh, question from uh, Dale Thomas from Massachusetts. And he or she, I'm not sure, uh, would like to know what advice you have for young BIPOC creatives who are struggling to get into the fashion industry. Should they feel encouraged? I mean, it, it's on both levels. When I started out, we didn't have social media. We didn't have you know, Instagram or anything. So you had to really meet people at events. You had to meet people out and you had to go see people with your books. And I do feel that even though the fashion industry seems close, this new generation have, you know, they have so much at their fingertips. You know, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, really find your community, which is really what I did. Really find your community, support each other, you know, knock down those doors. Don't stop. Don't stop knocking on my doors. You have to keep knocking on the doors, but really find a community who can support you. I mean, in my day, you needed an agent to get a job. But now I know a lot of photographers, stylists, fashion people literally can sort of email people directly, not email people directly, send them um, instant messages on Instagram and get booked through their Instagram. So don't stop. Whenever people tell you you're not enough, you just have to keep going. You know, I know it's hard for people of color in the industry, but you know, you have to keep going. You can't let people stop you and really make use of your network. Make use, you know, I had Pat, I said, I had Naomi, I had, but find a network so you can support each other, you know, because really that's what about being able to have find support in this industry that we work in.
Edward, thank you so much for spending a little time with us. Unfortunately, we are now out of time. Oh, uh, no. and so <laughs> I know, I know it went so fast. No, thank really you fun. so much for joining well, us. Thank you so much for having me. And keep and doing the thank great you. Job. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and thank you all for joining us today. And if you are interested in more programming from Washington Post Live, please go to WashingtonPostLive.com to find more information about upcoming shows. I'm Robin Gavon, and again, thank you for being with us.